do feel like my voice is going to give out. Uh, I do want to. I want to hasten today. Thank you, Cole, for that word. Amen. I'm thankful for young people that are passionate about Jesus Christ. I'm thankful that you don't have to wait until you're 25, 28, 30. But at 14, 13, 10, even younger, you can begin to fall in love with Jesus. And Jesus, as, as he said, truly is the greatest thing. Amen. I don't know if I'm going to preach or teach more today. Uh, so it would be good to have a notepad out. Uh, and uh, if, if we run out of time and you got to go, just go ahead and go. Uh, the Pizza Ranch Buffet is open for another two hours and nine minutes. Uh, and so that's, that is my gold standard. Uh, if, as long as I can get you to the buffet before it closes, can I get an amen? Okay, fantastic. Uh, one of these days we might actually have to do that. It's been a hot minute since I went to Pizza Ranch. <clears throat> amen. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 5. And verse 6, I do feel a burden from the Lord for this moment and for this, this next hour or so of our day, and I pray that your heart would be open and attuned to what God wants to accomplish in this place. Amen. Matthew chapter 5 is the beginning of what we call the Sermon on the Mount. If you have not already done so, I would highly encourage you to read through Matthew 5, 6, and 7 at the beginning of your year. Uh, read through it several times and really take the time to slow down and digest it. For in these three chapters of Scripture, Jesus gives us great instruction for kingdom living. How to interact with our fellow man. How to live in the kingdom. In case you did not know, being a Christian has far more to do with how I live every day of the week versus how I behave for a short period of time in the house of God. I, I, I could and I should come to the house of God and lift my hands and lift my voice. And if, if you have questions about that, before you write everybody off as crazy, uh, I would love to sit down and look through Scripture with you. Scripture does indeed command us to make a joyful noise unto the Lord. It commands us to clap our hands unto the Lord, to dance before the Lord. And as has already been referenced, I am I, I don't praise Him because of what I I am, I praise him because of who he is. Even if everything in my life is a, is, a, is a mess and it's falling apart and I'm unemployed or I'm sick in body or my bills aren't paid, he's still God and he's still good. He's able to fix every single one of my problems. And so I don't come in because I'm good and praise him. In fact, I don't want you to feel like because you messed up this week, you can't praise him. I felt that pressure. I know what that's like. And you, you begin to lift your hands, and it's like there's a little voice chirping in your ear that says, you, you remember what you did on Tuesday. You can't praise the Lord. That's a lie. It's a lie from hell. The devil wants you to silence your praise. He wants you to stop lifting up the name of Jesus. He wants you just to sit back and ruminate on your failures. But as Micah declared, rejoice not against me, O mine enemy, for when I fall, I shall arise. Amen. Is there anybody perfect in the house? All right. If you're keeping score, that was zero hands raised. So if nobody's perfect... That means all of us have failed God. That includes me. I appreciate that there were not loud amens. I'm thankful for that. We're learning together. We're learning together. I have failed God. And man, I feel so stupid when I fail Him. But I have learned. I have learned that it is as simple as coming back to him with a confession in my mouth and saying, God, I'm sorry. 
Now, it's not a magic formula. There has to be a sincerity in your heart. But as you come to him and say, Jesus, I'm sorry for, will you forgive me? Forgiveness flows in that moment. That's why the devil fights confession so hard, because confession unlocks forgiveness. And when you begin to confess it to Jesus Christ, you're bringing light to an area of your life that the enemy wants to keep shrouded in darkness. That's why you will hear people give testimony in Jesus' church of how they were delivered from pornography. They were set free from alcohol or drugs. We're not ashamed of our past. I'm ashamed of the sin, but I'm not ashamed of the blood that Jesus shed to make me clean from my sin. And as I begin to confess it to him, as I sincerely open my heart and say, Jesus, I'm sorry, forgiveness flows. And I can begin to worship the Lord without a care in the world. Amen. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6. For the sake of time, which is rapidly slipping away, we're just going to read a few verses out of what are called the Beatitudes. In Matthew 5 and verse 6, it says, Blessed, I don't think I gave the media team this, but uh, they're, they're amazing. Everybody, put your hands together for the awesome media team that we have. Did you know that they are usually the first people here and the last people to leave every service. That does not just happen. You don't just walk in and the lights are on. Well, well, <laughs> maybe you do just walk in and the lights are on. But somebody has come and turned on the heat and turned on the lights and vacuumed up the carpet and made it to look nice. And I'm thankful to be a part of a church. All right, let's get into the Word of God. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. With your attention for the next few moments, I want to teach uh, you, you did not know this, but now you do. There is a test today. Everybody go ahead and slap your neighbor and tell them there's a test. Don't worry, it's not on algebra. Uh, I don't know how many of us could pass an algebra test right now. Uh, but this is called the broccoli test. The broccoli test. Amen. Let's go to Daniel chapter 1. In verse 1, I, I feel to teach a little bit here, and I do believe God has a heart for this moment. And though I may be quieter or going at a slower pace, don't, don't, don't tune me out, don't shut down, because in a moment, the Spirit is going to begin to move in this house. Amen. I want to walk through a story in the first chapter of the book of Daniel. And kind of read through the narrative, and as it goes, I'm going to break in a little bit and give some commentary. And we're going to talk about this hungering and thirsting after righteousness. Daniel chapter 1 and verse 1, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. I'm amazed that I somehow made it through that verse in my sleep-deprived state. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. Now, if you're not familiar with the full import of the Old Testament, you might be a little bit confused by that clause. Because Jehoiakim and the children of Judah and the city of Jerusalem are declared as God's city and God's people. But here, Scripture tells us that the Lord gave them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. And he says, with part of the vessels of the house of God, and Nebuchadnezzar carried these into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. So God gives over his covenant people. The Lord allows the vessels of worship from his house to be brought into the house of false gods. 
Now this is more than just pressing something out of its intended purpose. This is a declaration of worship to the false gods of Babylon to say, My God triumphed over Jehovah. And yet, Scripture says that God allowed this to happen. Why? Because the children of Israel and the children of Judah had rejected constant warning and constant voice of Scripture in the form of prophecy and had turned their face away from God and gone after their own ways. And God continually tried to pull them on to the path of righteousness, into the path of purity, into the path of obedience to Scripture, and yet they would not do it. And so the day came where they ran out of mercy and God allowed them to go into slavery and in verse 3 the king speaks to a guy named Ashpenaz the master of his eunuchs anybody want that title print up your own business cards that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom there were no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom, cunning in knowledge and understanding science, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. And so basically, they've conquered the land, they've slaughtered a lot of people, They've left the poor of the land to tend to it, and they take the prime of the land back to Babylon and begin to instruct them. They begin to teach them. They were looking for the best-looking young men, the smartest young men, the best, uh, the, the wisest, those who showed the greatest level of aptitude. They took them back and began to instruct them. And in verse 5, it says, The king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years that at the end thereof they may stand before the king. It is supposed that Daniel and his three compatriots that we learn about in the next verse, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were in their early to middle teens when this happened. We have anybody between the ages of 13 and 15. Any 13 to 15 year olds? Do we have a gap? Okay. One, two. All right. For a moment, I want you to imagine that an enemy has come into your country. You have seen Untold thousands die, first of famine and siege and warfare, and then in just wanton slaughter after the capture of Jerusalem. Your own parents have probably been killed, and now you are taken to the king's house. And in verse 7, they began to strip away the identity of these teenagers. They take names from them. Each of their names, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, each of them contains within it a reference to Jehovah, to the one true living God. And so it would not do for the Chaldeans or the Babylonians to leave these names in place. And so they begin to rename each of them. Daniel they rename Belteshazzar. And Hananiah they rename Shadrach. And Mishael they name him Meshach. And Azariah they name him Abednego. And each of those names contains within it the name of a Babylonian God. This world would like nothing more than to change the name which is called over your life. They would like nothing more than to change the label that you are willing to be identified by. And so now Daniel is taken from his parents. He's taken from his home. He's seen horrific things. He's being indoctrinated in a foreign land. And he no longer is able to go by the name that reminds him of the one shred left of who he was. Uh, It reminded him of the God of Israel. Now uh, he has to be called by a God of Babylon. And the king begins to feed him and to teach him. 
But in verse 8, something amazing happens. The Bible says in verse 8 that Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat nor with the wine which he drank. You see, there were Jewish dietary laws that Daniel had learned at some point in his life as a child he had been instructed in the ways of scripture yes uh, the land in which he lived was a land of wickedness uh, but Daniel's parents had seen it fit to instill inside of him a respect for the things of God uh, can I tell you it does not matter how dark that our world gets uh, you can still make a difference in the lives of your children if you will begin to teach them and instruct them in the things of God. They're not too young. It's not too early. You're not being too intense. But the Bible commands us to teach them, to talk about them when we're sitting, to talk about them when we're standing, when we're getting up, when we're going down. Every area, every aspect of our day, we can begin to teach our children about the one true living God uh, and about his commandments in scripture uh, and the day may come uh, where the enemy tries to take kids uh, uh, the day may come where the enemy tries to separate parents from children uh, the day may come where they'll try to make Sunday school uh, illegal uh, the day may come where homeschooling uh, which several families in this church do uh, may become illegal uh, the day may come like other countries countries in this earth uh, where it is assumed that the government has responsibility for the teaching of children uh, and not the parents like the word of God proclaims uh, but I've come today to encourage a mother or a father in this place uh, plant the word of God down inside of their heart uh, put it in the soil of their lives uh, don't just sing them a nursery rhyme when they're going to bed uh, but pray over them uh, and pray that they'll get the revelation uh, hear O Israel the Lord our God he is one Lord uh, you can start while they're young uh, they don't even have to be a year old uh, begin to implant inside of them uh, the scripture begin to instill down into their life uh, the word of God because someday they might be Daniel in a foreign land Daniel at a tender young age Purposes in his heart, I will not defile myself with the king's meat. The king's meat was the best that there was. It was organic, fair trade, grass-fed beef like a certain family is always talking about. It was the creme de la creme, if you will. I don't parlez-vous français, so that's all I got. It was the best meat possible from an earthly perspective. The king was trying to give Daniel the best chance that he could to survive. The best chance that he could to thrive in this world. But Daniel understood something. He understood that this meat was not prepared in the way in which God had instructed in the law for meat to be prepared. He also understood that it was likely that this meat was sacrificed to a false god. Even though he bore the name of a false god. There was something down inside of the heart of a youngster that began to rise up. And began to say no. No I know know what he's trying to do and I will not defile myself. Uh, parents, let me go just a step further. Your children may begin to develop uh, more strict convictions than you do. Uh, do not try to squash that. Uh, do not try to, 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 to smash that down. Uh, they might start praying more than you do. Uh, don't get jealous. Don't get upset. Uh, be excited. Uh, be the one that's going to help them to thrive. And so Daniel purposes in his heart I will not pollute myself I will not defile myself with meat uh, that goes against the teachings of scripture and so he goes to the prince and he says look I don't want to I don't want to do this I don't want to eat this I don't want to consume this 
And verse 9 says, Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. I submit to you that verse 9 would not have happened without verse 8. The reason God was beginning to elevate Daniel is because he looked into the heart of a boy who had every excuse just to engage in wickedness and saw a flame burning that refused to engage in unrighteousness and said, that is what I can engage in. That's what I can bless. Now the prince of the eunuch says to Daniel, look, I'm afraid of the king. He's given you this meat and drink. This is a grass-fed ribeye. I'm getting everybody hungry right now. This is pizza ranch roasted chicken. He said, look, he's given you this, and he's going to see that your, your faces are worse likely than the children which are of your sort. The world can't conceive of a life lived differently than them. And they'll try to tell you you're being deprived. That's his defense. His defense is, look, I don't want you to deprive yourself of these nutrients. Don't buy into the trap that you're missing out on something in this world. I said, don't buy into the lie that you're missing out on something important because you have chosen not to defile yourself. Don't buy into the lie that your kids are missing out because maybe you won't let them run with a certain crew or, or watch every movie that they want to watch or even watch a movie at all. Don't buy into the lie that your kids are lonely and losers all the time because you won't let them go anywhere that they want to go. It's a lie from hell. It's the enemy's fear being projected into your mind uh, you can stand uh, and purpose in a heart I will not defile myself with this world and the prince says look the king's going to have my head and so Daniel realizing that that door is closed he goes to a guy named Melzar it's interesting that Daniel is the one who is mentioned as having purposed in his heart the heart of who you follow matters. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah follow, and they never discourage him. The heart of the follower matters. Mama warned me about peer pressure, but there is such a thing as positive peer pressure. If the pressure is encouraging you to conform to the Word of God, honey, that's good pressure. That's something you ought to welcome into your life. If the pressure of your friends is always to pick up a beer, to pick up a joint, to watch something you shouldn't watch, to cuss or to miss church, that's pressure that you ought to sever out of your life. But if your peer group is always saying, hey, we should talk to the Lord, we should go to church, we should get involved, we should have a Bible study, that's the kind of pressure you need to surround yourself with to make it in this day and in this age. And so they come up with a challenge and they say, look, prove your servants ten days. Let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Go ahead and take a look at our faces after ten days and the countenance of the children that eat the portion of the king's meat. And as thou seest, deal with thy servants. And so he gives in and he tests them for ten days. Do you, do you realize what they're asking for here? They're saying, look, for the next ten days... We're only going to eat things that have grown from a seed. That's it. They had access to the greatest meat of that time in the world. And they said, I'll, I'll, take, the, I'll take the vegetables. And so Melzar takes away their portion of the meat and the wine that they should drink and gave them pulse because that after 10 days, he looked at them and realized, man, they look better than all of these people that are scarfing down all of the stuff that the world wants them to eat. 
Let's just move that directly into the spiritual realm then. There is a spiritual diet which will influence your life. If you're constantly filling your heart and your mind with the voice, with the images and the influence of this world, uh, I've come to tell you it is slowing you down, uh, it is pudging you up, uh, and it is clogging your arteries. Uh, but if you will say, uh, I refuse to defile myself uh, with this world's entertainment and this world's mind uh, and this world's system, uh, but I'm only going to entertain those things which are of the Lord uh, at the end of ten. And days uh, your life will be transformed uh, your thought process will begin to shift uh, the patterns of your heart uh, will begin to turn and will begin to move and so God looks at these four children who for a period of three years are instructed in all of the ways of the Babylonians uh, and for three years they engage in this diet where they eat only things that have grown from seeds. And God gives them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. At the end of it all they bring him before the king. They, they set him before the king, and the king in, inquires of them and finds them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all of his realm. Everything was available to Daniel. Every carnal reason was given. A new home, a new name, other Hebrews doing it. But Daniel had something down inside of his heart that said, I will not defile myself with unrighteousness. And so here, here for you today on this first Sunday of the year is the broccoli test. Will I turn down the king's meat for a plate filled with broccoli and trust that God will take care of me? Will I stand for righteousness in the little when it's not convenient? Will I be righteous when it is dangerous? When I'm at risk of physical punishment for it? Will I stand for righteousness and obedience to the word of God uh, in the small things that nobody else sees? Do you understand how easy it would have been for Daniel to rationalize away disobedience to one precept of the word of God uh, while always declaring, well, I still believe in God. Do you understand how simple it is for us uh, to pick our chosen little sin uh, or our little area in our life that we wall off and don't allow God to have access to uh, and we declare it just a little thing. Uh, it's just a small piece of unrighteousness. Uh, I know that God's dealing with me, uh, but when the chips are down, I'll always do right in the big things. No, my friend, uh, because if you cannot serve him uh, in the little, you will not be able to serve him in the big. Uh, Daniel was never going to be able to stand uh, as the number two man in a kingdom uh, until he passed the test of the broccoli, uh, until he was willing to push away the plate uh, with the delicious steak on it and declare, no, uh, God's word says I should not have that. Uh, it's not enough for me to be known uh, as I used to be a Christian. Uh, but in the secret place uh, and in the private place uh, when nobody else is watching uh, when my mom isn't around anymore uh, when my dad isn't around anymore uh, when the church isn't even by me uh, when I'm alone in my house uh, I've got a choice that I can make uh, and I have to choose time uh, and time again uh, I will not defile myself with what this world uh, wants me to eat uh, I'll not consume what this world world wants to feed me. Uh, send me the broccoli, Lord. Uh, send me the vegetables. Uh, test me, try me, and prove me uh, in the small things. In Matthew 25 and 21, Jesus declares to the servant, thou hast been faithful in a few things, and I will make thee ruler over many things. Faithfulness in the great is not likely 
when we will not be faithful in the least. Or let me say it this way. Righteousness at the smallest level matters. We will not stand before God and be able to justify our actions and say, well, it wasn't like I was killing people. I I wasn't like robbing banks. No, no, my friend, uh, not when the word of God declares that a liar will have their part in the lake of fire. You see, it's, it's the tongue, uh, it's the life, it's the mind, it's the little things down inside, uh, those simple small things that begin to grow and they begin to sprout. It changes the course of our lives. And if we can serve well in the few... God can entrust us with the great. In Daniel chapter 3, the king sets up a great golden statue. See, this is the point that many of us think that like something would rise up and we'd be like, no, I ain't going there. He commands everybody in his reign, bow down and worship this statue. And Everybody in his reign bows down and worships the statue except for the three guys who a couple years earlier said, no, I'm not going to eat the king's meat. You give me the broccoli. Everybody else failed the test except for the guys that passed the little test. Don't tell me what you're watching. Don't tell me what you're thinking. Don't tell me how you're acting in the secret place. Doesn't matter. No, you will not stand for righteousness in that day if you won't live it now. If you won't live in a way that is hungering and thirsting after it. If there's not a heartbeat inside of you that says, God, I want to live right with your word. I want to walk right with your word. I want to do what you've called me to do, Eve. Even when nobody is watching. It would be shocking if somebody walked into the house of God and began to play lewd material loudly in this room. Shocking. And yet somehow we can go home in the absence of people and rationalize it and begin to declare, hey, this is all right. It's not affecting who I am. It would be shocking for somebody in the presence of the brethren in a, in a place where we could be seen to stand up and just, and, and just declare that, you know, I'm a liar, I'm a loser, I'm a cheat. But we want to rationalize it in the small thing where nobody's watching. There's a test that every single one of us will have to pass. Can I be faithful in the little? Because the God who created me, the God who breathed life into me, that God uh, sees every thought. uh, He sees every motive, every attitude of my heart. uh, When I don't see you, uh, when your parents don't see you, when your spouse doesn't see you, God uh, sees you. uh, And I believe I'm looking at a group of people in this place that has a desire uh, like Daniel down in inside. Uh, I want to not defile myself, uh, but I want to live pure. Uh, I want to live right. Uh, I want to live holy uh, in the little things, uh, in the little things, uh, in the little things. uh, And God will see and God uh, will always honor. And so the king brings them to him. And he says, look, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you won't worship the God that I've set up? In verse 15, it says, look, we're not going to read all that. When you hear the music, I'll give you another chance. When you hear the music, just bow down. Or I'm going to throw you into the fiery furnace. He's nice enough to them to give them another chance. He's like, look, I know that you didn't want to engage in the unrighteousness the first time, but Let's give you another shot. And I love, it's one of my favorite portions of scripture in verse 16. Look at it, what it says. It says, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. 
And I would to God that that's the attitude of the last day church. We have nothing to be ashamed of. When you stand for righteousness, when you stand for holiness, when you build your life upon the foundation of the word of God, you have nothing to be ashamed of. The world might not do it. The world might think you're funny for not engaging in the same behavior that they be, they engage in. Your classmates might might begin to mock you and laugh at you because you no longer want to go. You might lose a friend because you no longer want to smoke a joint with them. You no longer want to go to a bar with them. A relationship might fall apart because you refuse to engage in fornication or adultery and you decide, I want to keep my vessel pure. Oh, there ought to be an attitude in the end time church. I'm not talking about a rude or crude attitude. I'm not talking about a judgmental or a pharisaical spirit. I'm not looking down the end of my nose, but I'm simply going to declare, as for me and my house, I'm going to live by the precepts of the word of God. I'm not going to be careful to explain my behavior to them. And so the king flies into a rage and he throws them into the fiery furnace after heating it seven times hotter it's so hot, it's, it's beyond its intended purpose that the people throwing them in are killed by the heat. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are walking around inside of the fire. And the king has a vision of a fourth man inside the fire. None of that would happen if Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego hadn't decided long ago, I'm not going to defile myself in the small things. I'm going to live right, I'm going to live pure, I'm going to live holy in the small things. Everybody saw them in that moment. In the moment where their, their righteousness was called into question, everybody saw them. But God saw them in the moment where a plate was put in front of them. Modern Christianity calls it the Daniel Fast. It's the Daniel diet, okay? We just hit a wall right there. It's a Daniel diet, okay? A fast is no, no, no eating. Daniel does a 21-day fast later in the book. That's the Daniel fast. I was miserable on the Daniel, fa Daniel diet. See, it's so ingrained. Miserable. My body was designed to consume meat. How do you think Daniel felt? Do you think some of the other eunuch princes were watching? And they start seeing that ribeye pushed in front of them, and Daniel just slides it to the side and says, No, give me that broccoli. Give me that righteousness. It might be good for a moment, but I know that this is better for me in the long run. It might be pleasing to my flesh in this moment. Oh, I know that my taste buds want a ribeye right now, but I know what my God said in his word, and I refuse to defile myself. Bring on the corn on the cob. Bring on the squash. Bring on the pumpkin. Bring on whatever vegetable you can think of. Bring it on. I'm going to eat that because I want to honor my God in the small things. See, if I can't stand for righteousness in the little, it's not likely I'll stand in the big. Difficulty does not free us from obedience. Righteousness, purity is independent of the challenge of fulfillment. In Philippians chapter 2, it tells us as Jesus humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. In the very same Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is teaching us about temptation in which he says, if your right hand offend thee, cut it off. 
But we live in a world that wants to rationalize righteousness. It wants to rationalize godly behavior away and declare, well, my circumstances don't really allow for that. My employer doesn't really allow for this. Or I, I, I got a lot of pressure at work to do this, that, or the other. Or my classmates, they, they, just, they, they get offended by my stance on the word of God. That will not be an answer for us in that day. Not when Jesus became obedient unto death. Even a horrific death on the cross. Uh, but he had to bring this flesh into subjection in a garden. Uh, he had to bring himself to a place uh, where he purposed uh, in his heart. I am going to fulfill my call. Uh, I'm going to do what I was sent here to do. Uh, and became obedient to the prophecies about him. All the way up until the point uh, where his life. Life was snuffed out uh, and he faded uh, off this earth in a painful and horrific manner. The writer of Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 4 says this, You have not yet resisted unto blood striving against sin. And I ask you, when's the last time we've preached about that in Pentecost? I feel like I should clarify He's not talking about somebody else's blood. He's talking about your blood. But the moment the going gets tough, the temptation arises to sacrifice the small things while giving in to the delusion that somehow I'll be able to hang on to the big things. It's the broccoli test. For three years, can you eat it while everybody else is having the time of their lives? Paul would write in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Are we doing okay? Everybody doing all right? If I'm too long, somebody let me know. Okay. Either everybody's scared or I'm not too long yet. 1 Corinthians 9 and 27. You should be. Coming after that beef. Just kidding. I love beef, okay? I'm not preaching against beef. This is not a vegetarian church. Do you understand the point that I'm making? Okay, thank you. I love beef. It is the greatest thing that, well, right next to bacon, it's the greatest thing that God gave us with four feet on planet Earth. I mean, they walk around on them little cloven hooves eating that grass. But Paul said, I keep under my body. And that's our problem. Far too many of us have this, let this body just run rampant and wild and do whatever it wants. Well, I still believe in God. What was Jesus' word? If you love me, keep my commandments. Long before that was ever spoken out of the lips of Jesus Christ, that was the heartbeat of a little Hebrew boy named Daniel who was relabeled as Belteshazzar. His heart was, no, I love Jehovah too much uh, to transgress his word. And that's the burden that God wants to lay on this church at the beginning of this year. Uh, not because it's preached over the pulpit. Uh, not because it's, it's just what we do because we're Pentecostal. Uh, but that there would arise such a hunger inside of us for righteousness uh, that it drives us uh, to heartfelt obedience at the littlest of things uh, so that when the day the big thing comes uh, we're going to stand uh, in righteousness we're going to stand in holiness we're going to stand uh, in obedience to the word of God Galatians declares that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump 99% of your life may be pure. But unless dealt with by Jesus Christ and the blood of Jesus applied to your life and the waters of baptism cleansing your soul, that little leaven will leaven the entire lump. He's talking about yeast. You can, there are far better bread bakers in here than I. That's another thing God gave us, gluten. Whew. I love that mess. I'm telling you, a ribeye between two pieces of fresh sourdough. 
does life get any better than that? I submit to you that it does not, other than being in the presence of Jesus Christ. I'm sorry if anybody's fasting right now. <laughs> or Daniel dieting. I totally forgot where I was. Somebody help me out. <laughs> a little leaven will eventually leaven the whole lump. See, it doesn't matter how many times you run the aisles, how high you jump, how much you put in the offering plate. Unless you deal with the leaven in the secret place that nobody sees but you and God, it's just a small thing. It's just a small thing. But give it time. Give it time. And it will begin to grow. Nobody in this room would be okay with just a, just a little bit of cancer. And the doctor's like, well, you got a little bit of cancer. Well, get it out of me, doc. No, 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 we're, we're okay. We're just, we're going to watch it. We're going to wait and see. We'll just, just keep doing what you've been doing for the last 40 years, and we'll, you come back in another 40 years, we'll take a peek. Not a chance. I want it out of me. I want it gone. I want to be declared cancer free. I want my life uh, as I stand before him someday uh, to be declared well done thou good and faithful servant. Throw up Philippians chapter 3 again that Cole just referenced. Maybe. Let's talk about beef some more. What things were gained to me those I counted lost for Christ. Go to verse 8. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Watch verse 9. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. The beauty of it all is, is that no matter how hard you try, you will never be able to fully eradicate wickedness out of your life. Uh, but there's a God who knew that, uh, and so he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, so that you, uh, responding in faith, could have his righteousness appropriated into your life. Uh, now it's no longer about my list of performance. It has nothing to do with your performance. It has everything to do with your faith uh, and obedience. Uh, and if you will simply respond to Jesus Christ in faith uh, and say, thank you, Jesus, for offering yourself uh, as my sacrifice uh, and out of love begin to walk in obedience to his word uh, and submit yourself to what his word teaches and declares, uh, then the righteousness of the one who was pure and holy uh, and and sinless uh, and without fault and without flaw will be applied to your life. Uh, that's why uh, when the devil begins to remind me of what I was uh, and the devil begins to remind me of how many times I've failed and fallen uh, and how flawed I am, uh, I can agree with him, uh, but then I can stand up and say yes, uh, but it's not about my righteousness. Uh, it's about his righteousness. Uh, it's about his goodness. It's it's about his mercy. You don't ever have to be afraid of sharing your testimony. It's never, it's never, never, never wrong to celebrate the forgiveness of God in your life. It's never wrong to celebrate what God has done. But I hurry to a close today. It is so easy for us To be bothered by somebody else's big stuff and totally overlook our little stuff. God help us. When we look at others and begin to decry their lack of righteousness but never allow the lens of Scripture to turn back to us, we're far closer to being the Pharisees of Jesus' day than we'd like to realize. Why is it so easy to get upset when my brother or sister is breaking my father's rules? 
And why is it so hard for me to be upset when it's me breaking my father's rules? Ha. And here's the heart of God for us in this moment right now. Is there going to be a generation that is going to be passionate about righteousness? That is going to hunger and thirst after it. That is going to desire it more than anything else. Oh, I know, I know this world comes calling. But God is calling us to a place of holiness and purity with him. Would you lift your hands in this place right now? I want to caution somebody. The thing you allow to remain will eventually rule over you. The little leaven that leavens the whole lump will eventually fill an entire life. And Romans 6 and 19 says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey. Whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine that was delivered unto you, being then made free from sin. Can we pause for a moment and just give God thanks? We've been made free from sin. Not free to sin. I'm not preaching a gospel where you can just go do whatever you want and then run back to the altar knowing that you can get forgiveness. That is not a mindset of love uh, to a Savior that bled and died for you. Uh, but we have been freed from sin. Uh, that means I'm no longer bound by the sin uh, that once ensnared me and tangled me. And so then out of love, I become the servant of righteousness. I grab a hold of it and say, no, I choose to live this way. I choose to live in obedience to the word of God. Put verse 19 up there. And he says, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh, because you have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and iniquity unto iniquity. Even so now, now. In 2023, yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Righteousness is spiritual warfare. I know this is a very spiritually aggressive church, usually. Every once in a while we have a worship service where it's a little bit less aggressive, like today. Oh, oh, bless God. But every time you, by the power of the Holy Ghost, reject the evil and choose the good, you are pushing back the darkness of Satan's kingdom. Do not bemoan the unrighteousness of Watertown or of South Dakota while tolerating unrighteousness in your own life. But bring yourself to a place where you say, God, purge me of any wickedness in this flesh. And bring yourself to a place of obedience where you begin to serve God from the heart. Bring yourself to a broccoli test where you say, nobody's watching me right now except for God. Let's all stand in this place right now. I know we're not shouting. I know but nobody's swinging from the chandeliers. But I do believe that Jesus wants to have his way in this house right now.
Daniel begins to interpret dreams, have visions, faces horrific circumstances in his life. But he passed the test at a young age. And God knew that he had found somebody he could trust. Can God trust you with treasure? Will you be found faithful in the littlest of things? I know that I've kept a pretty broad spectrum today. And I know that it's easy for us to hide behind the lack of a pinpointed clarity. But if you will allow him, Jesus will help you today to find any corner of your heart where you've allowed unrighteousness to take up root. So I ask, is there anybody hungry for righteousness? I know it doesn't look as exciting as what this world is offering. But after three years' time, it proved that they were better than any other of the king's advisors. And Daniel, in his righteousness, outlasted Nebuchadnezzar. He outlasted Belshazzar. He outlasted Darius. And he lasted until the reign of Cyrus, the king of Persia. Why? Because when you'll win that test, God will trust you with influence. God will trust you with breakthrough. God will trust you with revival. If you're hungry for righteousness in your life, these altars are open today. Won't you come?